everyone. Happy Halloween Friday. Welcome to the huddle and welcome back to those who have visited us before. I'm Faith Suggs, one of your hosts. We are a normal platform on Monday, Wednesdays at Faith Family Focus, our main site, all thanks to our platform E360 TV. But welcome back. Normally every Friday we leave our boring lives, enter the huddle to talk about awesome challenges in life, adversity, stories, and have some really amazing guests each week. We're on to episode seven, so extremely excited about that. We've had some wonderful guests from Ash and Nicole Moss of Sports Illustrated, Nolan Smith. Last week, we had Shane Southwell, assistant coach from Kansas State, from Harlem, New York, who really talked his way through an amazing career um, for us and just, you know, the experience of the young coaches taking over right now in the NCAA. So that was a really awesome show for those of you who joined us. If you missed it, feel free to check it out on E360 TV under The Huddle, or you can scroll down right on our Facebook, which we are on right now, and you can catch any show from Faith Family Focus or The Huddle that you have missed. Um, so we didn't have any two shows this week for Faith Family Focus, which those of you know is with my father, Shaper Suggs, former NFL player with the New York Jets and the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, and so we, we were running a wonderful series on mental strength. And we talked about accountability, habits, self-discipline. Really great show um, as he's starting to put together his inner winner series um, and really dive into, you know, life coaching. We're really excited for that for Faith Family Focus. Uh, but we're going to have a really amazing guest and author join us to talk about relationships and the psychology behind relationships next week or in the coming weeks. We're on November 14th, I believe, um, to really kind of give us a different aspect. We talk about family, we talk about faith, we talk about sports, but we really would love to dive into relationships. So we're really excited for that for Faith Family Focus. And we will let you guys know when that is on the way. Um, but we are very excited for today's show. Um, of course, we've had great guests so far. Last week, like I said, was really fun. Um, and people, a lot of two people tuned in. That was a fun one. Um, but we are really excited for this week. Okay, so it's episode seven. Um, and we have a wonderful, wonderful, amazing woman, Kirby Porter. So Kirby played basketball at Harvard. She was a guard. Um, and then she turned into marketing and brand genius. Um, she is Sports Business Journal. She's laughing in the background. I love complimenting our guests. Sports Business Journal's new voice is under 30, which is a major honor for those of you guys who don't know, and I'll have her kind of touch on it. Um, and then she is now the investment director of marketing at Will Ventures, which I spoke with her about a year ago about, but you know, she made a transition and she'll talk to us a little bit about that as well. So I'm very excited to have Kirby on today. She's going to talk a lot of, about marketing sports, the transition from sports to adulthood, which is something I've been through and a lot of us have been through. Um, she talked about branding and then, of course, name image likeness, which I'm really excited to talk about because she knows what she's talking about. She's a former athlete, but also because she works in the brand marketing era. And she is kind of that youth of tomorrow when it comes to marketing. I'm really excited for kind of the, t the change of tide that's happening within that business. So after this quick break, we'll have uh, Kirby on and we'll talk all about her story. Good morning, Kirby. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. So where are you at right now? Tell us what you're doing. I'm currently based in Boston. I've been here for about a year and a half now when I joined Will Ventures last July. I was in New York for two years at Pepsi, but it's good to be back in the bean where I went to school. Yeah, I bet. But I've only been to Boston. We play Boston College. So an amazing city, I think. It's definitely different, but I love the different. history that comes <laughs> with it. Um, yeah. And we can dive a little bit into that because that goes with your transition. Now, when you were with Pepsi, which we'll get to all this, were you in New York? Yes, I was. So I can I can walk through my career background now. Mm -hmm. um, I played basketball at Harvard and kind of got my footing in sports while there. Um, I interned at the Patriots, I interned at Under Armour, both amazing experiences. Um, but both of those taught me that I also loved marketing. So that's why I started my career at PepsiCo. Um, I began in our brand marketing department there. I was on our Mountain Dew brand team. I was on our sports marketing team. And over those two years in New York, I also started a podcast called Court to Corporate, which was um, which we'll touch on today, but it was really about that um, journey as an athlete starting a new endeavor in business. And I thought that there was a new way to cover how we talked about the transition because at the time, you know, uninterrupted was emerging. The boardroom had just started. 
um, the Players' Tribune was there and we were seeing this new model of athlete-driven media that had really kind of created a revolution for professional athletes and how they were viewed um, in the business room. And I thought that needed to exist for us 98% that didn't go on to play professionally. So that was my attempt with uh, Court to Corporate and mm -hmm. grew it over a year and a half. And then last July, I joined Will Ventures, um, early stage VC firm, we're investing in sports and technology um, and joined the team to lead our marketing here. So it was felt like a leap of faith at the time, um, but it's all made sense. It's been an amazing experience, have learned so much. I absolutely love the startup and venture space, speed of it. I think a lot of athletes thrive, uh, thrive in this area for sure. Um, so happy to dive into that more. Yeah, I remember when we spoke a, oh, it was a year ago, right before my season started, COVID season, um, and everything's been so busy since then. You had just made the leap yeah. into this completely different era. Um, area of learning and marketing and just doing more for your your career and it was really exciting so i remember that and we talked about the transition of athletes we talked about how athletes can capitalize off of these changes in these certain arenas and i really feel like since then you have kind of evolved into even more of a discussion of what athletes can do for themselves and it's really exciting and we're going to get to that um but i really want to dive into your story a little bit so one thing i love to talk about is where we're from is kind of who we become and so talk just a little bit about where you were born, where you're from, and then kind of how that molded you to kind of maybe choosing Harvard or your next steps. I love that. Um, okay, so I was born in Houston, Texas, but I was only there until I was five, so I don't really claim it. I was raised in Maryland. Um, so Chevy Chase, Maryland, kind of right outside of the DC area, went to schools around the area. And um, I would say the, the years that really shaped me were my high school years at Bullis. So that's where um, I transferred to in 10th grade. It's when I, I, would, I had always taken basketball like really seriously because I started playing AAU in like third grade. But when I realized that my my freshman year high school wasn't gonna get me to where I wanted to go, <laughs> I was like, all right, we gotta, we gotta up and switch. And I feel like at Bullis, I really kind of um, stepped into more confidence in like who I am as, you know, like, the tall, awkward black girl, you know, like, you know, it's kind of tough, like growing up and um, kind of feeling out of place at times, I would say, but I would say a bullet, I felt like I started to find my home, I felt like I started to find people that I really connected with in sports, but also um, really connected with on the level of who I was, you know, as a black woman. And I feel like that started to really shape me and kind of inform what my my views and like my priorities were. Um, in terms of the spaces and like experiences that I wanted to be in. So, you know, like going to Harvard for me um, was kind of a byproduct of actually like being like injured um, and tearing my ACL in 11th grade, I think. Um, but I knew in that moment that I wanted to spend my four years at a place where I'd be happy like if I didn't play basketball. Um, and because it, it, you know, I feel like with those injuries, it's like you just realize how finite it is and how it can really just be gone with the blink of an eye. And I felt like I, I found that family, that bounce, that environment that really encouraged you to explore and pursue all that you are um, outside of a Jersey um, there. So I would say, you know, my, my roots have definitely kind of informed the, the person I'm becoming now, um, not just, you know, in terms of the passion that I have for athletes and the sports space, but um, also how I really value, um, you know, just being in communities of, you know, black women and getting back to black women in my career too. I feel like that kind of started um, in high school. Yeah, and I feel like that's what sports and sports in general for women provides is it's a bigger community for us to communicate with one another, bond, scissorhood, um, but also diversity and inclusion and feeling like you belong and seeing women, young women that also look like you and you can choose to be around women who look like you. And I think that's the beauty of sports and what it provides bigger than just, you know, the life um, lessons we grow with it through leadership, et cetera. But when we talk about Harvard, let's talk a little bit about your family who, because at this time, it sounds like a sports system has to be key during this time, right? Because you made a lot of transitions, you chose to pick a different school, and then you chose through... I mean, which was a very advanced decision for a lot of student athletes in comparison to trying to go and play somewhere where they think, okay, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to be able to play, I'm going to this, 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 and that, and be kind of put into the hamster wheel, which nothing's wrong with that. Well, a lot of us do it. 
Um, but you made the decision to pick long term. When you talk about Harvard, how big were your parents during this time when you were trying to figure this all out? And also, were they on board or was it something you had to kind of convince them on? Yeah, they were they were huge during that time. Um, I like they were like a sounding board for me, like through the process. And it's so funny. It's like the I just remember the discussions that we were having then and like how they were kind of guiding me and helping me think like critically about things are the same like roles that they've played in like major transitions in my life since. Um, you know, for for example, when I was at Pepsi and was like, should I like should I go to Wolf Ventures? And you know, they still had that support for me and helped me think through um, you know, one that they fully believed in me and that I could do it. I remember, you know, the self-doubt with like Harvard, like Harvard, like, mm. I don't, I don't know about that, <laughs> you know, like, am, am I ready for that? Or, you know, like, will I like it? Will I, will I um, do well there? And um, I feel like my parents really helped me one, like see that, like, if, if I just lock in, I can do it. Um, but also just help me think about like, you know, what are the things that I think are best for me? and to always lead with that level of intention, not in a selfish way, but just being like very purposeful in how you move, I would say. Um, so they're very pivotal then. And it's it's funny, I feel like they've played the same type of role many, many times again. Yeah, and that's beautiful. And it's just such a blessing to have a great support system, especially when you talk about athletes. And of course, every young woman isn't, you know, blessed with that experience and i was blessed with great parents as well and it's just you're so thankful because you don't realize how much you need your support system until you become an adult and you have to make adult decisions yep. you have to start you're like gosh i need somebody who's on my team who yep. knows me that knows what i've been through and like i don't have to explain everything to them to help me make these decisions going forward and i think that sometimes parents shift from parents to cheerleaders as we get even older because sometimes we just need that co-sign. We need that, you know, consistent agreement um, when we need it, obviously when it's beneficial for us to make those big leaps um, from one place to another or one school to another or even just one city to another, which is big for kids in their 20s for sure. So let's talk a little bit about Harvard. Now you graduated in what year? 2018. 2018. Okay, so talk just a little bit about it. You went to Harvard. What was that experience like, be, like being a student athlete at such a prominent institution? Um, I went to Duke, so we were very prominent as well. We love to put that out there, but we also um, were very much athletically pushed. Um, and what I have learned over the years is my brother now, he starts his second year at Yale. Um, so he's experiencing his football to education balance as well. So I would love for you to talk a little bit about your experience because who would know better than you? Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, overall, I loved my, my four years there. I, I look back on it and it's just crazy the ways in which it's really kind of shaped and form, um, you know, the impact that I want to have in my career, um, like the aspirations that I have, the community that I entered the real world with. Um, it's really a blessing. I would say going back to that that first point of like, all right, entered my my college decision knowing I wanted to be somewhere where I would be happy if I couldn't play basketball. Um, and I would say at Harvard, I definitely found that bounce. I always say I was an athlete that wanted to do both. I never wanted to just be confined to basketball. Um, both from a time invest, a time standpoint, investment, and social standpoint too. I was very balanced in that, you know, I'm all in, like I'm the life of the party with my teammates. I'm very present with my teammates, but I was also, you know, very deeply involved in building my black community at Harvard too, because that was really important to me when I thought about, you know, four years out, now we're crazy. In two years, it'll be like our five year, <laughs> but you know, it's like those, you know, we've been in New York and those are the girls that have been there and, you know, we're scheduling reunions and birthday trips and like just really having that community on both sides um, was everything. And I feel like being able to pursue that balance while there was key. I would say also um, both from a professional standpoint too, I feel like that's where I really started to refine what I was passionate about in my career, that being sports. Um, and really having the platform to pursue those things, right? I would say 
the unique thing about Ivy Leagues, and I'm sure your brother is experiencing, is that you don't have to be on campus during the summer. And so, you know, when you look at the horizon of the four years and work backwards, that means you can pursue those internships that unfortunately a lot of other student athletes aren't able to. And so um, I think that was another kind of driver in my decision process. And I was very intentional about filling up those slots. Like it's it's, as early as freshman year, um, having that internship with the Patriots and then building on that for Under Armour and then building on that for for PepsiCo. Um, I would say all of those things are things that I've fortunately been able to kind of parlay into my full-time career now. And um, I would say the last piece of it is that I think it really helped me, um, you know, develop in my my leadership and um, kind of view things through like an impact lens. Like my role in the court, I was not the best player on the team. And like, I'm the first to own that. <laughs> I would say like my role, you know, my first years like didn't play a lot, right? And then my junior year, I actually started, but my role was definitely more of a role player. And then my senior year, I started was a captain. I actually didn't play that well that year either. But I feel like um, I grew a lot in like mental maturity over the time and just realizing that there's like different ways to make an impact in basketball. Um, and I feel like that helped me tremendously um, own my role as a senior captain that, you know, wasn't balling out the gym, but was extremely present with their teammates, invested time as much as I could in every teammate off the court um, and just tried to find my lane and stick to it. And I feel like that's like a mental framework that like I've brought to to life. Yeah, and I think that's so awesome because similar to me, I had a similar career where you understand what really matters within a lot of it. And I think for a lot of athletes, we don't realize that until the end, um, how beneficial are the relationships are that we build, how beneficial, you know, what we say to our teammates, how that impacts their own maturity, their own growth, all these great things that help you. But one of the biggest things I feel about playing basketball, about playing college basketball, especially when you're kind of thrown to the gutter in a lot of situations, is that you learn how to really form genuine relationships with people that help you and help them at the same time. And it's not one-sided. And I feel like for me, it, it showed me when you invest in somebody, it helps them in their growth and their maturity and their journey is as inspiring as it would be for yourself. And that's one of the biggest things I learned is what true leadership really looks like um, and teamwork and support, especially like for other women, um, which is a big thing that like is a beautiful thing, right? In today's society, especially with black women and how they try to bring each other t- along, right? That's just what we do. Um, when we talk about Harvard, when we talk about your journey, the internship piece, and we can talk a little bit about how key that is for athletes. I want to take a pivot and remind people that's not normal, <laughs> like that they get a summer to intern. One of our biggest struggles was I was working out and doing an internship when I was at Duke and I was exhausted and I couldn't give my all to the internship in a way where I grasped any education from it, but also left an impact on the internship that made me feel happy and proud of my experience, right? And so that's one of the things that I think is amazing that you got to do was intern with the Patriots um, and get that experience, right? And you said Under Armour and all those things where you got to kind of immerse yourself in what was coming in the next couple of years when that ball stops bouncing. And I think that's the biggest piece to the transition that is a struggle for athletes because some are immediately thrown into the fire and told to figure it out, right? Network now, create a resume, create a cover letter, create all these things that we never really allowed you guys to kind of figure out until spring, right? And so for me, I want you to talk a little bit about how key the transition and what you've learned in your process and why you kind of wanted to talk about court to corporate. Yeah, honestly, that's such a great insight that you said um, on having that visibility earlier on into the sports industry, I'm sure has made the transition much smoother, candidly, right? Because early on, you know, as early as how old are we in freshman year, 18, 19, um, you see that you can stay close to sports even if you're not directly playing. And I think that kind of, it makes the, the mental switch not as drastic 
because I knew that was something that I would be working towards long term. And I knew there was an opportunity to stay close to it. Now to go back generally to the transition and um, how it eventually evolved into this court to corporate message. I'll say, you know, in building that brand, I always acknowledge that my experience was not the experience of the majority of athletes. And so I think in sharing insights and bringing other people along and telling other people's stories, I always tried my best to be very intentional and in getting a diverse range of point of views um, that the majority of athletes could relate to and not center it around Kirby Porter. Um, mm -hmm. I will say the message and transition for me, I honestly kind of felt that drastic, like what now moment when I first started at Pepsi, um, because I wasn't, I feel like when people look at my career, they think I like actually started my career in sports directly. But when I started at Pepsi, you're entering like a three year rotational program until you're kind of, you know, just moving within the marketing department. And going in, my my plan was, OK, I'm going to rotate across Pepsi marketing brands year by year. So within the Pepsi office, we have Pepsi, we have Mountain Dew, Life Water, mm -hmm. Bubbly, Starbucks, Lipton, um, Brisk, you name it. We have a lot of beverage brands. Um, I didn't think I was going to work in sports all at Pepsi, and I thought I was going to be there for a little bit. So when I got to Pepsi, I'm on the Mountain Dew brand team, and my role is not in sports and I'm not playing sports anymore. And I also don't have any ties to sports. So I literally, I just felt this whole like loss of identity. And um, for me at that same time, I was also starting to just like follow my curiosity. Like I think every, whenever, I mean, if I ever write a book someday, like that's gonna be a common theme that any major transition or major breakthrough of an idea um, or thing that I've had has been because I'm constantly pushing myself to learn um, and follow what excites me. And at that time, it was athlete driven media. I was fascinated by uninterrupted by the Players Tribune, um, by the boardroom, and was just diving in every day after work, studying it, staying up until God knows what hour, just like researching everything I could about athletes and business, the origins of uninterrupted, Kevin Durant and Rich Kleiman, like just anything and everything I could about it. I was studying it. And I think in that moment, I realized that um, as an athlete, going back to my last point, my other point that I always wanted to do both. As an athlete, I always wanted to be more than what I was assigned to in my jersey. And I realized as early as like a month into my career that I could not be one dimensional. <laughs> like I, that's not me in the slightest. Like I could not just do my job. I can't. I'm going to do great at my job. I'm always going to do an amazing job at my job, but I cannot just do my job. I had to recreate what my both is. I had to find my new sport and my career. And for me, that was finding my brand. In short, it was figuring out a way to take this inspiration that I saw and figure out how does this, what's my unique point of view? And then how can I begin to kind of communicate my interests and who I want to impact through content. Um, and so that's the you know origins of court to corporate. And I would say my my message, although it wasn't all buttoned up in the beginning, but what I realized it, what it was at the end of time was trying to tell the narrative of life after sports differently and to encourage athletes to not view it as a transition, but to leverage what they've learned from sports. Because I think transition in the essence of the word is to go from you know one state of being to another. But when you leverage, you realize that you don't have to, at a stop of a dime, erase everything that you've gained from athletics and yeah. write the resume from scratch and find a new story. You can think deeply and critically about how the strategies, insights, lessons, community that you've gained from your time in your jersey can now catapult you in your career. And that's kind of what I did with Court to Corporate. So that's my message around the transition. Pretty lengthy, but I, it's something that I, I love talking about. And I feel like it, the point of view changes over time. But um, I think it's such an important topic for athletes to hear earlier and earlier on because um, it's yeah. something that we all struggle with. 
Yeah, and I love that you changed it from transition to just more of like an evolution of just adding on. I think one of the biggest things about athletes is, and you hit it right on the head, identity comes from the very craft it is, right? What you spend most of your time for 23 years doing is dedicated to a sport, to the game you love, to whatever it is, right? And then at the drop of a dime, you know it's coming, you see it's coming, sometimes people don't, but sometimes people do. All of a sudden now you have to figure out and what you think society tells you is that you have to leave that behind in order for you to become successful because that doesn't matter. But instead what you have done and what, what is perfectly what needs to happen is that you understand your experiences, you understand that that is a leg up in a lot of stuff, but also adding on to it and evolving from not just the athlete, not just the basketball player, but the woman who did in fact play basketball, but also has this, 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 and this, right? I wrote a book. I'm a freelance speaker. I can do this, right? And I think that's beautiful when they talk about forming your next identity because in each chapter of our life, it changes and evolves into what we what we don't know if it will become, but what we do become. Yeah. And I think that that's a perfect word for you not to say transition, but more adding things on in addition and evolution and all the amazing stuff that comes with um, understanding what inspires you and sparks you out of bed every day. Um, because that's definitely something I had to learn was I was like, I'm still, I went, immediately went into coaching. I was like, I'm still around the game, but I really don't like it. Right. I don't like the scheduling. I don't like, I feel like I haven't really achieved anything yet, which I know I can do. And so what can I do to challenge myself? Started my business. Cool. Let's get into podcasting. Cool. But let's make like, start to fill that bucket where I'm starting to figure out that I'm doing better than where I was. And I think that was the biggest thing as athletes. We always want to continue to grow. Like you said, you always want to continue to learn. And when we don't, we start to feel stagnant and we start to feel uncomfortable and we start to mm -hmm. feel, then look around and it's like, gosh, so-and-so starting to do that. Like maybe I should dive into that. And I think one of the biggest things that come from that is during this time period, so much mental health and like struggle comes from athletes. And I've had so many raw, authentic conversations with former teammates who just are like, I do not know what to do with my life. And it's like the answers are right there, right? Just form the connections, network and all that stuff. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I've learned from it. And that's what I love what you said is that just add on and evolve and you capitalize on your brand and who you're becoming. And I think that was the best part about it. I love that. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about, so I do want to get back to your senior year of college because this is big, um, exactly what we're talking about. How in the heck did you figure out and plan on what you wanted to do? Because like, like we said, that's not normal, but this <laughs> a good part, regardless if it's a college student, a kid a person coming out of their fourth year with Google, whatever it is, that moment where you're starting to like, the gears are turning and you feel like that, the um, end line is getting closer and closer and closer. How did you figure out, gosh, in the moment, I know what I'm gonna do. Did you figure out and connect with Pe Pepsi early or was this for the moment through a networking thing? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say my, my planning for life after sports started my junior year um, because I knew that that internship, my, sorry, excuse me, the internship before my senior year was going to be the job that I took. So I knew that. So I, I wanted to intern somewhere that one had a pipeline to full-time opportunities um, and two was a job that I would take <laughs> um, post-grad. And so um, that year, what I, you know, there's a lot of uh, now like new programs um, for athletes specifically and um, athletes of color. There's one called like Make a Play Foundation, which is similar to this program that I did in undergrad um, called Management Leadership for Tomorrow in MLT. It's basically a professional development program for um, minority students. And I joined it my sophomore year. And basically their goal is to build that pipeline of young, high-performing black talent. And I actually learned about Pepsi through um, MLT. And I remember um, we had one of the conferences and I like got a Pepsi flyer and I like threw my name in for the interview and they were coming to campus. I was talking to my best friend Destiny on, on the team. I was like, uh, I don't know if Pepsi's for me. I was like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I wanna like market beverages. 
She was like, just try it. She's like, you never know. She was like, don't say no to yourself. And literally like, uh, I'll tell her one day, I was like, I feel like that's that was like a life changing moment for me because if I hadn't just given it a try, I wouldn't be where I am today. Because I think it's so important in your career to keep an open mind about the experiences that you're encountering and what you can learn from them and not just look at things for the surface level and really give everything a fair shot. So for example, like if I was just looking at the surface level of Pepsi, I could be like, oh, like I'm just like marketing like beverages. But no, like when I joined Pepsi, I'm like learning like brand management 101. These are billion dollar beverages that are in like the crux of like entertainment, culture, sports, music, fashion. Like you have to think of the scale of these brands, right? And so that's why I always say like never dismiss an opportunity. I think similar to, you know, Will Ventures. I knew nothing about venture capital at the time. I, I worked my ass off to understand it, um, but I didn't know anything about it. And I easily could have said, oh, I don't, I don't know anything about venture capital. It's not for me. Right. But I really took the time to learn about the investment thesis, which was inspired by sports and how the firm works and how we work with, you know, brands and athletes and players associations and all these things to help startups. And um, to get back to the point, I started planning my junior year. And um, I would say for me, I knew I wanted to be in sports, but I also knew I wanted to build skill sets that were transferable. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people at Harvard do that through like going through consulting or finance, but it just wasn't for me. It like, I was like, I'm not passionate about this. One thing about me is like, I have to do something I'm passionate about, or I just, I can't do it. Um, yeah. it I, I think it's a great thing, but it might be a downfall, who knows, but I love it. Um, I think it drives me. Um, and so for me, I think it was like, marketing is exciting. These brands are exciting to me. Um, and I think this is a place that I can really, really learn a lot early on and, you know, take those skills with me wherever I go. Um, right. So my plan originally was to stay at Pepsi for, you know, a good amount of years and then eventually think about, you know, getting directly into sports, but you make plans and, and life yeah. happens. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that was kind of the thought process. Yeah. And it, it, that's beautiful because at the end of the day, a lot of, I think a lot of the greatest things that come in life are the things that we least expect and the things that we don't always believe in as much at yeah. first. Um, and sometimes you do have to take, you took an initial leap of faith and then you took another leap of faith, right? As you pivot and learn and mature and you figure out what you love to do. And sometimes just those very experiences you start with are the very ones that give you confidence to make your next step. Um, and that's a big thing for athletes, especially when you're entering a world where it's something that's still new to you and you're still constantly learning and trying to educate yourself on. Um, so let's talk a little bit about brands. I, it's name, image, likeness time. It's happened this summer. I started working with Huron Media Co. We work with a bunch of athletes. I work with women's basketball. And we have seen the good, the bad, the ugly, the wonderful that comes from working with brands and working um, at the end of the day, trying to navigate this new space in this new arena. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you have loved from it so far and what you have seen encouraging from it that you think will be continue to be beneficial for a student yeah. athlete in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think what is most exciting to me is the innovation that'll come from it. Um, innovation and in technology, but mostly innovation and in, like mindset for athletes. Like, I just think that, you know, at a very base level, like when we're thinking about that target audience, get all like marketing on, on here, but like you think about the target audience of like the college athlete right now is in the Gen Z category. And we all know that, you know, their motivations, desires, um, you know, passions are drastically different from a career standpoint than millennials, right? Yeah. Like they all want to be their own boss. They all want to make a living doing what they love. They all want to pour into their passions. They don't have desires to climb the ladder for 40 years. Like that, that's gone, right? And I think for athletes, what's really exciting is that they're realizing their potential of themselves as a business 
earlier and earlier on. Because I think the successful brands that are going to be built are ones that are multifaceted and not rooted in the sport. So they're going to really build a brand around things that can carry with them after they're done playing. They're going to get brand sponsorships that are not tied to whether they're shooting a basketball or not. And I think a lot of that comes down to viewing yourself as, you know, a brand and kind of like a, you know, franchise, like empire yourself versus being like a conduit for other brands and messages. And so I think that's kind of like the root of what I preach, like what I advocate in the space is that, you know, I think what's been exciting is that there's been like a lot of like press and everything and like headlines for like these million dollar deals and athletes signing with like Puma and Beats, whatever. But it's like, that's not gonna be the reality for the majority of athletes. And you shouldn't be discouraged by that. You should actually be excited and think about another way to go get to your bag. And I think the way to do that is to really build your own brand through content, build a community, build an audience, productize yourself through digital and physical products and really like tap into that entrepreneurial mind that I think all athletes have early on because you can do it now. Um, so I think the opportunity is in you know being an entrepreneur. I think that opportunity is bigger than um, you know brand sponsorships. Yeah, I completely agree. One of the biggest things as you said, which is I think is the biggest hit or miss within college athletes is some get it and achieve wonder can achieve wonders and some are still missing that piece where it's bigger than just signing with multiple brands that don't align with who you think your personal brand franchise is for the long term. And I feel like at the end of the day, that's not authentic. And that is key to making a strong relationship with the brand when it comes down to you don't want to be an athlete anymore, right? But they still want to create that relationship. And I think that the the people that can benefit from this the most is young women because I feel like young women are transparent across everything that can be right. They can do beauty, hair, they can do sports, they can do uh, podcasting, commentating, they can use that. Right. I've seen a lot of young women during this time. They spoke there. I think I want to be on TV. I said, well, you can be on TV now, right? We can, we can put you out there. We can start your own show. We can do this. You can get sponsorships and you can show people that you can navigate the business side of things, but also have the talent to do it. And I think that the biggest thing for young women is that they just have to learn that you don't have to have 30,000 followers. You don't have to be this major voice across college sports, but you do have to have your truest self evident on your social media is you do have to show people the type of person you have put yourself out there and I think that's the big thing for Gen Z is they all want to be entrepreneurs but they also are like they want to have that humble facade to them they don't want to put their lives out there and they're very much more private which is very interesting to me which I don't understand what that shift happened right mm-hmm. but because all of us we were like Instagram was within our generation like check out my life right like check out where I am and but when you get to my brother's generation which is still in college he's like I don't really use it I don't really see the need and I was like well when you break down a brand and we think think about like what companies are now looking at when they hire and trying to understand the person they want to work for them and work with that's a key piece. So understanding that's part of your resume, it's part of who you are, it's part of your digital footprint on life, right? And what you leave behind. And so that's why I think young women have such a great potential within this arena. We talk about name image likeness, if they capitalize off of it the best. Now you talk about, I mean, we talked about forming your identity and your brand through not just sports, but you know everything you put into it. What do you think has been the biggest mistake that you have seen so far from athletes, from agencies that are now obviously involved, from college coaches, anything across the board, what you have seen? Yeah, man, it's still so early. I would say the biggest opportunity is, um, so here, here's my thing. I think it's, the, the the opportunity is in the education and mm-hmm. how athletes are currently being encouraged and applauded by the masses for capitalizing on the space. 
Um, I think the applauds for a brand deal, like a cookie cutter brand deal, are much louder for some reason than like an athlete like starting their own podcast right. or own brand or yep. you know whatever. It's a lot of focus on deals when I think the focus should be on ownership. And when I say ownership, I don't mean that you know athletes need to find the capital to go invest in a startup. I'm saying <laughs> there's much lightweight, easier ways that are literally at our fingertips today, like literally at our fingertips. Like they're like, I want to make a map of all the ways that you can monetize yourself for like less than $20, like, and just to show athletes the opportunity that, you know, look, like if you have 5,000 followers and you make a paid membership and you only convert 20% of those followers on a monthly basis, that's going to be recurring revenue that's going to be sustainable over time or hey if you have a podcast you can build a digital product on how i launched my podcast you can list it for x dollars on gumroad or teachable or all these platforms and have that as the anchor of a digital asset that you can use to distribute to your audience repurpose over time turn into different forms of media and content that you can resell and repurpose right like there's just so much opportunity that is bigger than like a one-off like sponsorship post. And I think there needs to be like more energy and focus towards that. Completely agree. Completely agree. Your voice has more weight. Like the, sometimes people oh, forget. You're on mute. Oh, it's okay. You're fine. Um, so sometimes I forget. It's funny. We, people, they don't understand the struggle we have for the show. Sometimes we as women as athletes we forget like how much we know that others don't know right how much people want to know about our lives and our stories and how we started a podcast how we got into court to corporate how we created an ebook right all the things that people are like that's an awesome idea how did they do that i want to do it too and i think that like you said there isn't enough emphasis on ownership we talk about merchandise when we talk about creating Bas summer basketball camps that we never could do before, but you can create this if you want to go into coaching. You can start now creating that revenue, creating that community around your brand and around your basketball camp IQ, and then you can spread it. Right? So many ideas amongst just starting, but we put so much emphasis on, but have you gotten any free stuff? Have you partnered with like so-and-so? Well, you see so-and-so partnered with this, and it's just – I think that that's a very agency driven style and professional driven style to name image likeness because professionals go towards putting their footprint across eyes, right? How can I get my face in front of so many people and grow and grow and grow that way? So then I can do my give backs, my foundations, my merchandise, all the things that we want to do in comparison to college athletes. I feel like they would benefit, like you said, off ownership first because there's something for them to stand on so they can get creative later on. And I think that that's the biggest piece. And I think that we're missing that a little bit. And do I think that it'll shift? I don't know. But I hope it does as we start to get more educated and colleges get on board and start to try to educate the kids more and the coaches more. Because I think that's the biggest thing. It's a big tug of war between what should be allowed in some places Versus some colleges are completely accepting it and setting their students up like Texas, their students up for success within this, within this arena. So I love that ownership is such a key part. I've never really thought about that, but I can see completely, especially if I was in that position, I'd be like, gosh, what can I do to make money while I sleep in a way that doesn't require too much from me? And exactly. that's what we're missing a little exactly. bit, <laughs> just, just a little bit. I, it's going to be my mission to change it. I'll, I'll put that out there in the universe right now. So 2022, I'm changing it. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. I feel like you're the right person to do it. If anybody doesn't follow Kirby on uh, Twitter, she posts a lot of amazing stuff and just thoughts and tidbits um, in terms of marketing, but mostly for all this crazy stuff with name image likeness. I think that's another thing is like, there's not enough like sane voices around this. Do, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, Pat Karen, he does a great job just teaching the kids, Joe, just do this. And, you know, cap, you just capitalize off this. You don't have to sign a thousand dollars. You know what I mean? Like all that type of stuff, just capitalize and build 
so that those options come to you later on. And I think that's a big piece. But one thing I think, and I kind of want to talk about a little bit, is knowing your worth with on all of this. And that goes past name, image, likeness. It goes to, as former athletes in general, knowing our value and our worth in a new arena, in a new space that we're not normally comfortable with. Um, how did you navigate like self-confidence beating, um, what am I looking for? What's the word I'm looking for? It's going to come to me, but where you feel like you don't belong. Yeah. Yeah. How did imposter syndrome? Imposter syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh yes. Um, mm. and I would say, I feel like there is, you know, pieces of that, like anywhere you go, right. Like at Harvard, my first year was tough. (laughs) It was really hard. Um, and it was like a huge adjustment. It was a really big adjustment. And, um, I would say it took a, um, it took a L for Mm -hmm. me to be like, okay, like I can, I can do this. I just need to lock in. Right. Um, and I think that first moment of like, Ooh, like, I don't know if I can do this, but really doubling down after and like coming back like a hundred times harder and getting my GPA back up to a great place over the four years that kind of like carried with me to like everything that I do like in basketball too like you know freshman year was definitely tough um but I put the work in like 10 times over over the summers to come back like better than I could um but i would say you know professionally especially like as a as a black woman i feel like there are always times where you know you're going to you know one be the only um you know two feel this pressure to over deliver yeah i would say that's a common theme for a lot of black women and something that you know i feel like we all like talk about with each other especially in the sports industry um is that you have to over deliver Yep. right like that that's kind of the bar that we set for ourselves um and pressure that we we put on ourselves that sometimes isn't always healthy i'll say so i think yep. for me my career has been a balance of having that drive that i i found at harvard where i'm always going to over deliver because i'm never going to have that l again like i'm always going to put 110 percent into anything that i do i'm going to give great results. I'm going to be the best teammate and I'm going to bring the best energy. Like that's just like how I, I try to come into any space that I work in. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if, if there's a role, like my goal is to like redefine like what the description is at the end of it. Like that's how I like approach things. Um, but I would say the flip of that though, is then managing that as a woman and especially as a black woman where you have to find the balance between doing great because you want to do great and that's just who you are, but also managing the pressure that you put on yourself and always asking yourself, like, (laughs) sometimes I have to check myself. I'm like, who's asking you to do all this? Like, sometimes I just be doing the most, you know what I mean? Like I'm trying to do 20 things at once, or I'm like trying to go above, above, above and beyond on something. I'm like, wait, who asked you to do this? And it's me that asked me to do this, you know? So it's just like, you really have to, bounce that. And I think that pressure really stems from a lot of the um, imposter syndrome that we face in the workplace and just feeling the need to, to prove ourselves like time and time and time again. But sometimes like, I definitely didn't make this up, but I feel like it's a quote around like the black woman world. It's like, it's okay to just exist. It might be an Elaine Welch Ross book. Like I love that book. It's right on my table over there. Mm -hmm. Um, But like, you're like the whole, like, you're more than enough. It's okay to just be you and like take up space and exist. And sometimes you don't have to like kill yourself to get a result, yeah. right? Like it's okay. So I feel like that's like a theme that like I'm trying to like manage in my career. Um, Cause like it can definitely like lead to burnout at times, you know, like it's hard, yeah. but um, it's, I think it's about like managing it and channeling it in the right way. Yeah, completely understand. I think a lot of it comes from the generations before us that worked harder 
than we ever had to work. And they, that mentality that came down to us is to work twice as hard. And I was talking to my dad about this the other day as we talk about this new era of black coaches coming into the NCAA. And no longer is it the one black token coach on staff. Now you have black staffs, period, right? And you have one, maybe a dobo or some, you know what I mean? It, the diversity emulates what the court looks like. And I was explaining to him, I said, we're pushing past that generation of work twice as hard. Now we have the remnants of, I don't know why I'm working so hard, right? I don't know why I'm like pushing, 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 pushing. And when I don't, when I sit down, I feel like I'm not doing enough. And that's one of my biggest things. If like I sit down and watch TV, I'm like, I have something to do. (laughs) I do. I have something to do. I know I'm supposed to be in because I'm not doing anything. I'm wrong. Right. And you get that sort of anxiety. You're like, gosh, something's wrong with me because I'm lazy. Right. And so that is something I've learned as not just a black woman, but also as an athlete is you feel like you're not doing enough. And when you're not feeling like you're doing enough, you feel like you're letting down somebody, a team or something, because we learn to work as a team for so long that we feel like what we do will let down others. And I think that Like you said, when you have that honest conversation with yourself, like, why are you doing this much? It doesn't even make sense. And and then I started to put my head to things like, is this paying me? Like, that's when I started to like, how can I prioritize my time? Is this actually paying me or can I do this on Sunday? And that's one of the biggest things that I had to do because it is a thing that we feel. It's like you feel that imposter syndrome creep in because you're like, okay, because I'm not doing enough, I'm not doing great. And I think that that's a big thing is when you check yourself and you have that conversation with uh, yourself, like who said you're not being, doing great, right? Who said that you're supposed to do this, 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 and this, and take your laundry out? Like, who, like, relax. <laughs> who said that? You did. We put the pressure on ourselves because we watched our parents work so hard and we watched their parents. And I think it's it's beautiful. It's history. It's generational intelligence. But it's also something that, like, we just carry on our shoulders. And it's starting to see that the more we talk about it and the more vulnerable about it, the more it will hopefully get easier and better for ourselves to have these honest conversations with ourselves to just chill out and just relax. Just relax. I I feel you on the, like, like, who told you to do this? You know, like, the whole, like, sometimes I literally feel like I can't do nothing. And that's not good. That is not good. Like, that's not normal. I'm not encouraging anyone listening to this (laughs) to adopt that mindset because, like, I should not feel guilty for, you know, like watching you on Netflix, but I was like, I was like, just trying to enjoy the season finale. It was really good. And I couldn't enjoy it because I'm like, I have an email to respond to, or I'm like, I should be doing this. I should be doing this. Or like, I should be like putting out content. I'm like, Kirby, relax. (laughs) Just calm down. Like, it's going to be fine. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. I feel like that's like a mental framework for me that has actually really helped, um, in this world where I feel like it's, um, you know, just com- comparison, 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 or everything's moving so fast. You feel like you should be doing something. Um, you never feel like you're doing enough. Just like reminding yourself that it's like, I am I am where I am right now. And that's that. Yep. That's where yep. I'm supposed to be. Yep, exactly where you're supposed to be. Because if you weren't supposed to be, if you were not where you're supposed to be, God will tell you not where you're supposed to be. I've always had to check myself as like, then why am I here? Relax. And I'm glad we talked about that because that's a big piece. But Kirby, thank you so much for joining me today. You're an awesome person and even awesome, excited for your career um, and everything. For those of you who don't know, Kirby, what is your Twitter so people can go connect with you? Kirby Bangs, two S's. Yep. And so you guys connect and follow Kirby along. She, like I said, drops so many gems on social media for just marketing, brand, and life. And it's just awesome to kind of follow her story. So thank you, Kirby, for joining us this Friday morning. Thank you for having me. I love this conversation. Okay, awesome. Have a great day. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this Friday morning um, here on The Huddle with guest Kirby Porter. I hope you enjoyed. Once again, we are live again next week, Fridays at 10 to 4 a.m. Eastern. Thank you to Amazon Fire, YouTube, Facebook, Roku, Apple TV, and most importantly, our key platform out of Phoenix, Arizona, E360 TV. Once again, this is The Huddle presented by Faith Family Focus. Our goal is to enter The Huddle and leave knowing we've grown within these 60 minutes. We hope to see you guys next Friday. And then again, have a wonderful Halloween.